What's going on YouTube? Art App Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Hope you guys are all having an amazing day and an amazing week as we approach the 4th of July. Whether you're listening to this on the podcast or you're listening to this on our YouTube channel, there is a link to both of those areas in our show notes and the description of the video. So feel free to hop on over there and choose your platform you would prefer to listen to this. Today, we're gonna to be interviewing one of our clients. As you guys know, the whole point of what we do is to help mitigation with what you can possibly do to receive the best possible outcome in a federal sentencing situation. So today we have one of our clients by the name of Sean Sultan, who has recently been sentenced to federal prison. And Sean is gonna take us through a little bit of his journey, what that was like, and what he's doing now to actually prepare to go to prison. So Sean, I'd like to say hello to you and how are you doing this afternoon? Uh, hello, Dan. I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for asking. Enjoying life. Sean, I would love to just like dive right into this and give an introduction to our listeners and our viewers of who you are, what you were doing prior to all of this, what your profession was, and really how did you end up landing yourself in the scopes of the federal government? Yeah, not a problem. Uh, so I guess I'll start with my indictment. So uh, June 24th, 2019, my life essentially changed forever. Some could argue for the worse, I would say for the better. Essentially, I was served a 21 count indictment with a bunch of other co-defendants. This was a pretty, not a unique indictment, but a, but a uh, unusual one. What I mean by that is this indictment was for events that occurred five years prior to when the indictment was actually served. It had nothing to do with narcotics, nothing along those lines at all. It actually dealt with a business contract I had with a pharmacy. I mean, I pled guilty to it, so certainly the relationship was inappropriate. Essentially, it was a regulatory issue, which then turned criminal, which uh, I guess I can uh, get into in, large, in greater detail moving forward. But uh, for healthcare providers, just to be brief, you got to be very careful when it comes to regulatory issues. Regardless, I, uh, 21 count indictment was served to me. It was a complete surprise. Uh, within 24 hours, I lost my job as a physician. I was a chief of medicine. I was on board of directors for my hospital. Within four months, I literally lost everything. Uh, my wife had left me. I, don't, I certainly don't blame her. I lost my house. I had lost all my possessions. I had lost all my bank accounts. And I, at one point was actually homeless. Thank, thank God that uh, one of my good friends allowed me to stay in his spare bedroom, which certainly helped me. And then I eventually made my way back to Maryland, where I'm currently residing right now. How did you find out about the indictment, John? Were you, was it a phone call? Was it a knock on the door? Okay, yeah. So I, I actually used to get to work around 4.30 in the morning. So I was actually at work. My, uh, my wife at that time called me and said the FBI was here with U.S. Marshals uh, with a warrant for my arrest. At that point, I contacted an attorney that I knew from a, a prior litigation case. And uh, we essentially uh, called the U.S. Attorney's Office and we decided to turn ourselves in uh, at the local courthouse. And uh, that actually was my last day at that hospital. Yeah. So what was the actual counts? What were the original charges of the indictment? Oh, Lord. Okay. Conspiracy uh, to commit health care fraud, health care fraud, mail fraud, controlled substances, not oral pills, but topical. It was for topical. They said there were two prescriptions with my name with ketamine on it, just various counts among, but those were the four big ones. But, they, but it ended up being around 21 counts. And for someone that's watching this or listening to this right now, addition to the charges to the, what exactly did they say that you did? If you were to break this down to somebody and said, well, what does that mean? What did you actually do wrong? Or what did the government say you did wrong? What the government said I did wrong, and I did commit wrong, by the way. So this is certainly with me not making any excuses. Uh, I, I do want to preface this. What they essentially were stating was that I had a contract with a compound pharmacy and they're saying that the, con the contract with the compound pharmacy was a violation of the anti-kickback statute or, or the healthcare fraud statute to be more appropriate. Uh, essentially, the healthcare fraud statute, the way it's being read now, it applies to all funds, both government funds and private insurance carriers. Uh, we didn't have really anything to do with government funds. Ours was basic, basically private insurance carriers, but at the first proffer, I was told, actually quite directly by the U.S. Attorney's Office that private health insurance companies are now also encompass the healthcare fraud statute. So essentially it was a business contract I had with a pharmacy. And they said you were basically taking kickbacks that you were not supposed you, to be taking. You hit the nail on the head, yes. They said my contract was, I think, 35%. I think that's what it was of uh, net gains for, uh, for prescriptions written to a pharmacy. Yes, sir. In what length of time did they state that you were committing this crime 
uh, knowingly. That, you could argue that. I think the government was saying a couple months. I was physically involved for the pharmacy anywhere between four and six months. So around a, around a half a year, you had some sort of involvement with, with this potential situation. And to complicate things even more, Dan, I actually got legal opinion before I went into the arrangement. And then I went back to the lawyer to turn them in and I still, still ended up with the indictment. But, uh, uh, you know, as, they, as the old saying goes, you can't rob a bank and then give the money back the next day. You know? No, and that's really a great point because we hear that often from our clients that are under investigation or a possible indictment. And they're like, well, we refunded everybody and we gave the money back. And unfortunately, that doesn't negate the crime that was originally committed. Great point bringing that up. When the indictment hit, like you said, you were living the American dream. You had the house, the car, the wife. You had this entire, this entire life that you were living um, in a pretty good life as a doctor. When this, all, when this house of cards tumbled, how did it uproot your life mentally um, in addition to losing everything in a matter of you know, weeks? How did it change you mentally as well at that moment? It was a massive shock. I essentially uh, fell apart both physically and mentally. Again, this was unexpected. I thought that, you know, by resolving the issues with insurance audits and this being five years ago, that this would be behind me, but I was rather, uh, rather naive. So the first thing that occurred, I noticed was that I just couldn't, I was just very restless because I was in shock. My, uh, uh, my epinephrine level was skyrocketing. My drilling level was skyrocketing. I really didn't know what to do. And to make matters worse, the whole community was in shock because, you know, I, I was a model member of society. How could you be involved with something like this? You must be an immoral person. To summarize it best, it basically shattered me to my core. I became non-functional, if that's the best way to put it. I'd recently, at that point, had, I'd lost 20 pounds. I gained back 31 pounds in about a couple months. I physically saw everything around me slowly die. The best way to put it is imagine, Dan, if your eyes are open and then you're slowly dying inside. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And to, and to make matters worse, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a, uh, a bit of a type A personality. So I just kept doing research and research on indictments and, and the federal system. And, and uh, it was a very, very bleak picture. That's for sure. Did your case make any media attention in your surrounding local areas? Oh, it made the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's just because there was more than one physician involved and there were other healthcare providers. It certainly was a high media commodity case. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the reputation was completely ruined, but yeah, it, it, was, it was a tough time, Dan. So talking about basing it on your perception in that moment, bringing up the whole idea of contrast, where your mindset was there, when people would call you, because clearly this made attention, it wasn't like you could hide from this, friends, family, friends of friends, all knew what you had been accused of at this moment. What were some of the things that you would tell people or tell yourself during that early on stage of it, what would you say to people when you would talk to them when they would ask you questions about it? So there's a couple stages one certainly goes through after an indictment. I was still in the denial phase for, for a long period of time. I kept telling myself, well, this is from five years ago. The money should have been paid back. Everything is going to be okay. So I was in denial. So when anybody would ask me about it, I wouldn't take full ownership. Of it. In retrospect, I think if, if I were able to take complete ownership, things would have been a lot more easier. I was still in the denial phase. It was a very difficult mindset because although I was in denial, I also felt hopeless, if that makes any sense. You know, I'd go online, I'd Google, I went to the DOJ's website, and I would say, oh my God, their conviction rate is like 98%. And then with doctors, it's like 99%. I mean, prison was not in my life's cards. It wasn't in my family's expectations. So it was not only denial, but also hopelessness. And I think I probably alienated a lot of people. And I, if I could do things differently, which I guess we'll talk about in a bit, I certainly would have. How did you find yourself slowly digging out of that hole? Because a lot of people don't ever come back from that. A lot of people will stay lost in that abyss of blaming everybody else. How did you root yourself to slowly start taking accountability? So here's what happened. So I was indicted on June 24th. And by middle of October, Dan, I was essentially homeless. I, when I say I had lost everything, everything was gone. I was living out of my car. Uh, thank God a friend of mine allowed me to stay with him in his spare bedroom. That was a t very, very tough time. But I think I really needed to hit, hit rock bottom to really rebuild myself. Uh, the judge, uh, due to my living circumstance, actually felt bad for me. And he stated that I could actually go back to my parents' home in Maryland. 
And then when I came back to Maryland, I was still in a very, very deep, dark, very, very deep, deep, dark abyss. Just about as dark as it can probably get. Did you um, turn to any type of, of substance abuse or anything to help cope with, with the fear and the anxiety and just oh, yeah. your yeah. frustration of it? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So I was excessively abusing alcohol. Uh, more so as the numbing agent than anything else. Uh, at its peak, probably a bottle of vodka a day. It was a numbing agent, which I, in retrospect, I mean, it's clearly was harmful, but I understood why I was abusing alcohol. I, I just really wanted to disappear from reality. In retrospect, I was probably exhibiting some type of self-destructive suicidal behavior. But the sad part is this behavior even continued when I came home to my parents' house. But I can tell the exact date where something just changed within me. And that would be February 14th of, of 2020. That day, I decided to figure out what was wrong with my mind. Starting to look at my situation from an academic perspective. Got really involved with, with mindfulness meditation. I said, I was tired of being fat. So I said, it's time for me to start losing my weight. It's time to get healthy. It's time to stop making excuses. To make matters worse, a week later, I get my PSR report. And the PSR report showed a minimum of 108 months. I called my attorney up. You know, I just started this whole positive transformation for about two weeks. And I said, am I really looking at, you know, nine to 10 years? And his response was, yes. If it's in the PSR report, you're looking at that, that sentence. And I would start mentally preparing for it. I know you're, not, you're never really going to believe this, but that didn't really bother me at all, Dan. I still continue with my positivity. I started reading a lot about stoicism, uh, Buddhism, uh, exercise like a madman. I lost 41 pounds from February to my sentencing date. I stopped playing the victim card. I started, I started to realize that I was the one that created victims. Uh, I didn't have to take that contract in. Nobody put a gun to my head to take that contract. Uh, taking accountability was very important. And more importantly, Dan, I realized that I could live a meaningful life, that this pre-trial phase doesn't have to be miserable. It was just my perception of life, right, Dan? But my PSR report is actually very favorable outside the guideline ranges that were, recommend, that were recommended. The best thing you can do for the PSR report is to take your advice and is to bring your personal narrative with you to the PSR report. So you want the PSR report to essentially portray your side of the story, Dan. My side of the story, when it, when it dealt with remorse, uh, when it dealt with my whole background, when it dealt with my issues with alcohol, word for word where it was in my PSR report. Uh, most people, uh, you know, have a big trouble getting, getting into, their PSR, into their PSR report what they actually want. For me, it was as if I typed my own PSR report up because my actual narrative, Dan, I think I told you this, was copied and pasted on, onto the PSR report. So I think my PSR report could not have gone any better. And when you told your attorney that you wanted to submit your narrative to the probation officer that was conducting the interview... What feedback did your attorney give you on wanting to submit the narrative? He said, that's a great idea. He said, I don't understand why people don't do it more often. Is it something uh, that he had seen prior? No, he didn't. But he was very open to the whole accountability process, Dan, that we sort of put together prior to the sentencing hearing. Yeah, talk, uh, talk a little bit about the accountability and, and when you and I connected on some of the, share with somebody that's watching this right now with, with what is... What are some of the mistakes that you think you potentially would have made if you had gone about this alone? Okay, so the first thing is it's very easy to make excuses for your own accountability uh, because that's the easy way out. It's much easier to blame the U.S. attorneys. It's much easier to blame the FBI. It's much easier to blame the probation officer, to blame your attorney, but it's much harder to blame yourself. Without accountability, you are not going to get a favorable outcome. And this accountability isn't something, Dan, that you could just bullshit. You have to really feel, uh, have a genuine feeling for remorse. These judges, I mean, uh, they've been doing this for years and years, decades and decades. Uh, they can smell someone who is lying as opposed to someone who's being genuine. Uh, essentially, when we essentially spoke together, uh, I got the picture from you that if you don't express remorse, you do not build a new narrative for your life, you will have a bad outcome. And if, you do, and if you do show remorse, you build a new narrative for your life, you build a different story for your life and really act upon that as well, you will have a favorable outcome. And I guess we can talk about the outcome in a bit, but that's the steps I essentially took, Dan. I said, you know what, it's time to build your new narrative. It's time to build a new character for yourself, take accountability, stop feeling sorry for yourself, essentially be a man, face it head on. And uh, that's essentially what I did, Dan. 
and so when I, you talk about the narrative in the reference letters, uh -huh. you know, a lot of people out there wonder, is, is it worth using a service to have somebody write a letter? What do you think the difference in what you pulled from your letter, what ended up being portrayed in your letter versus what may have been in your letter if you had just started writing it, if you had just gone through this on your own? What do you think the difference is of not just being accountable, but the levels and the deepness of the layers of the accountability for you and for your friends and family that submitted letters? How hard is it to get into that, that direction of a mindset of where you're not allowing yourself to somehow beg the judge for mercy? So, you know, you got to first find out who Dan Wise is. And what's, it, what's very interesting to me is uh, about your YouTube channel is I, I was watching your halfway house video. And I noticed something about you at that video that you were, you were, you were not complaining at all. You openly admitted, look, I made a mistake. I'm not going to allow this to stop me. And uh, your actions of accountability are the main reasons, Dan, that we decided to work together because that's exactly how I wanted to be. Take full accountability and move forward with my life. With that being said, uh, the first step of working with you is that you, you know, it's, it's not like, Dan, you're going to write a letter. You work with Dan to get your thoughts formulated on a proper structure for a letter. I mean, how do you write a letter that is uh, not too long, but not too short? It has different structures that a judge wants to see. Uh, you're not going to get that by yourself because you, he, the judge doesn't care about how much your life has been messed up. That's, I mean, you did that to yourself. So judge does not care, but he does care about other aspects. Uh, you have to work with Dan and the more information you provide, the better. I think my, for my letter, I had like four or five pages of just facts. So I, I uh, I think that helped us. So, and also, when you go through these questionnaires with Dan, it's also like a mental thought process. It helps you organize your thoughts as well. Uh, uh, that was for my personal narrative and also for the character reference letters. And you know the saying, Dan, the proof is in the pudding, right? So uh, during my sentencing, the judge stated that I was the most remorf remorseful person he's ever sentenced. And he stated that I would become successful again. And he said that uh, your parents will become proud of you again. And he said, you will get through this. Uh, things like this happen in life. And he wished me the best. He had not one thing negative to say. And I think part of it was because of the process. I think he understood that, that I was genuinely remorseful for my actions. And uh, I did whatever I could to uh, change my own narrative in life. We did an interview process with Sean. We did an interview process with Sean's friends and family where there was a list of questions that were asked and based on their answers is the information that we used to start creating the direction of the narrative and reference letters. So Sean's narrative and Sean's family's reference letters was their own story. We just helped craft the direction to mold it properly so it wasn't a giant sob story or illustrating this beautiful picture of what a great person you are. Um, we, we had to find that balance to illustrate to the judge what he, what he wants to hear how Sean made changes beyond just saying, I'm sorry for what I did. So Sean illustrated that through a series of actions over the last several months on changing who he was to who he is. Sean, I know originally with the charges you were facing, you were potentially facing worst case up to life, but with the plea agreement that you signed, what was the guideline range of your plea agreement um, and based on the recommendation and what you thought you were going to receive. I know you spoke about it earlier, but just to bring that oh, yeah, up. My heart's going to pace a little bit, but I was at 31 points, Dan. 31 points on the offense level. And your criminal category was a? Category one. One, okay. So you can look at it yourself. It's not a good site. 31 carries. What's the guideline range on 31, Sean? 108 to 135 months. 108 to 135 months, which you guys see this illustrated on the screen right now. Um, and your attorney told you to expect what? Well, my, my, I, I love my attorney. He was a very straightforward individual. He said, you should always expect what's on the guidelines range recommended by the Office of Probation. So uh, you, were, you were expecting the low end. I'm sure, I think, didn't you say the government was even recommending the low end of the guidelines? Uh, yeah, I was expecting that. In fact, the only person I told, I think, was probably was you. I didn't even tell my family. I did not want them to freak out or, or worry. That's so I kept fun. this... I kept this deep to myself. And even through all knowing the fact that I was going to probably face nine years in prison, I still, I still wanted to change myself for the better. I really wanted to change my attitude on what it was like to, to face incarceration and the whole process. 
So facing 108, best case scenario, based on your guideline range, obviously there is no minimum mandatory. After it was all said and done, what sentence did the judge impose on you, Sean? Uh, well, thank, thanks to God, it was only 48 months. So 48 months out of what you were expecting based on guidelines of 108. Yes. What did it feel like receiving a 48-month sentence at that point? It, it's, it's a very surreal feeling. Uh, there's a big difference between 48 months and 108 months, Dan. I mean, from when it comes to planning life, uh, it feels as if someone's giving you a second chance to live again. That's the best way to put it. Uh, things that used to bother me didn't really bother me that much anymore. I mean, I know you get those typical stereotypical statements, but that's exactly how I felt. I guess you're, you feel like you're on cloud nine, but also uh, more so than anything, I felt extremely grateful. A lot of gratitude, extreme amounts of gratitude, Dan. When you really start to bundle all of this together, you know, in a 48 month sentence, uh, you prepared yourself from early on throughout the pre-sentence interview that if RDAP is going to be available to you, that you also have that information uh, highly identified in your pre-sentence report to your, your drinking use prior to the, uh, the arrest of the instant offense. How much educating on RDAP and narratives, reference letters, and the actual preparation part was that something that your attorney was, was, uh, had a wealth of information on for you? When it comes to actual sentence mitigation, Dan, I think this is absolutely where you excel the most. Sentence mitigation is, it's not a litigation or it's not like a order or motion that you write. It's an expression of how you, who you are as, as an individual and how you have changed. Attorneys are very good at writing short briefs. To write a novel about your life, you really have to go to a consultant. To make things a little bit more sticky, a lot of attorneys don't understand the importance of the narrative and the time frame, the RDAP program. Uh, the but main reason, Dan, I worked with you was not necessarily for RDAP. I mean, RDAP certainly looks like it's going to be in my future, but it wasn't the main reason I came to you. But you certainly have a wealth of knowledge on that as well. But one thing I will tell, uh, heaven forbid any of you guys have been indicted, if, if you want to do RDAP, you've got to be very particular about your PSR report. Yeah, and this ties into the to the being open and honest and the accountability and, and practicing humility, humbling yourself, because many of our clients that come to us, or some not even clients, just individuals we speak to, that come to us uh, past the pre-sentence interview phase, when they start asking about the program, and we ask them, well, what did you tell the probation officer? Many individuals are embarrassed or ashamed to speak of those truths during the pre-sentence interview because it's such an embarrassing topic and they, they don't want anybody to view them for anything lesser than who they thought they used to be. Uh, the transparency in educating somebody on not how to cheat the system, but how important it is that if you do have substance abuse in your, in your past, how important it is to be completely transparent with this probation officer. Yeah, Dan, I think you hit the nail on the head. If you're not gonna be honest with yourself, then you're really not taking full advantage of this experience. I mean, this is a few times in your, probably the only time in your life where this is like a forced meditation retreat, per se. If you have an issue, you're not honest with a judge about it, how can the judge have a clear picture of who you really are as an individual? People that go to the PSR interview unprepared, I, I, I just feel bad for them. It's going to be a very big uphill battle moving forward. I think the judge, judges, and I think even attorneys, uh, more particularly the prosecutors, they want honesty. They want to know who you are as a complete individual, because in the end, honesty will always prevail. Going back to a more logistical fact, if you, if you're PS, before, prior to your PSR interview, if you do not have a proper personal narrative, it's going to be a tough battle for you. It's, that's just going to be the reality. So with everything that's worked out for you to this point, um, prison sentence coming up in the near future, uh, I know right now you're still waiting for your potential designation. Your surrender date as of right now, did they give you a date? No, not, not, it said uh, no later than 60 days from the sentencing. Okay, so 60 days from the day, you were sentenced on what day? Uh, June 16th, 2000. So 60 days from there technically is your surrender date. And mm -hmm. if you don't have a designation by then, you would want to go in and request an extension, which is something that we do assist with. And with COVID-19 and everything else, you know, it's really determining, do I go in now or do I try to wait this out a little bit for programming opportunities? But in your situation, with the fact that you have, you have a highly reduced sentence from what you were anticipating, uh, you're going to get your good time of your 15%. 
RDAP, again, looks like it's going to be in your future, which should give you up to another year off of the sentence after your good time. So when this is all said and done, what have you calculated that you might actually, best case scenario, spend in prison? I think numerically, it's like 18 months is what it comes down to numerically. But, you know, as I said, Dan, it's just a blessing to even be in this position right now. I'll make the best of the time there. I've already enrolled in uh, Adams State College, which has an accredited pr prison college program to get a paralegal degree. I mean, I've been doing so much legal research now for the last, let's see, year. And why not get, get some certification behind it? I got my personal training certification. I want to write a blog, as, as we spoke about earlier. I want to put some time and effort into it. So whatever time I get, Dan, I'm okay with it. It's just, I just view life as a complete blessing right now. And speaking of the blog, uh, Sean's already submitted his first article to us for the blog, which you can go ahead and head over to federalprisontime.com, click on our blog selection, and you'll see, as an author, you'll see Sean on there where you'll be able to view his, whether it be weekly, biweekly, or monthly submissions, depending on his availability. Once he gets uh, into his federal prison, he's going to be reporting programs available, what the prison experience is like, how he's dealing with his time. Uh, just for us to be able to keep a, a level of, of openness with Sean to really show you guys what it's like before somebody goes in and how they deal with their journey on a day to day. That's probably people's biggest fear right now is not necessarily the fact that they're going to prison, but they have such a fear of they don't know what to expect. So the more they get to hear from somebody like you before you go and to see this amazing positive attitude that you have right now of this wealth of gratitude that you have right now and to show how you're going to be able to carry this through a prison system where there's going to be good days and bad days. And hopefully you'll be completely transparent. When you have a bad day, we want to hear about that, what caused your bad day and how you're able to, you know, bull through it. Um, because prison's not fun. It's not meant to be fun, but it is what you make of it. And uh, my prison experience was, as I say all the time, it was, it was more, way more positive than it was negative met some of the best people that I ever could have imagined meeting in what you would think is the absolute darkest period. As a matter of fact, today I just found out, we actually did an interview with him uh, about two years ago, a guy named Ford Casimir, who I was in RDAP with, extremely fit guy. He's in his early 30s, uh, got out, was doing really well, was an actor, and just found out he literally just dropped dead um, a couple of days ago from a massive heart attack. And Every day is precious. So with what you're doing right now, Sean, with just knowing that you can't change what's happening, you're, you're intercepting what's coming at you and you're spitting back out positivity. You're, you're choosing to not have your mind imprisoned. So I really give you big kudos for how you're handling all of this. And this is a huge model step for what other people should be basing their, their progression on. No, I don't, thank you for those kind words, first of all, Dan. But it, again, it's, it's a process. I mean, you, gotta, you can look at me and say I'm very positive, but there are steps you have to take both internally and also pragmatically. Again, you have one shot with the judge, one shot with the court system to prove to, prove to them that you, are, you deserve mercy. There's only one way to do this, and that's through your letters, your personal narrative, and your new life story. So the pretrial phase... Of, or the pre-sentencing phase, whatever you want to call it during this whole process, is the absolute most important phase. The best way to handle this is when you wake up in the morning, you have to ask yourself, what are you doing to yourself to better your circumstance? That that could be emotionally, mentally, and physically. Emotionally, are you going to sit there and be sad and cry and be a burden on your family? Are you going to be a child or are you going to be an adult? So control your emotions. You know, you can read Marcus Aurelius' book, Meditations. You can read Ryan Holiday's books, The Obstacle is the Way, if you need some motivation. But one of the key things about Stoic philosophy is, they always state this, action is much greater than beliefs. So reading does one thing, but are you going to put your beliefs in action? Second thing is, uh, physically, what are you doing? Are you, gonna, are you sitting there drinking all day, uh, eating tons of uh, un unhealthy food, or are you putting your mind and body to use? Uh, my philosophy was if they're going to take away five Dan, I want to add 10 to my life. So at that point I decided it's time to lose the weight, time to get all your health conditions under control. And, uh, if you're not 
waking up every day with that mindset of what you can do to improve, then when you're sitting there in front of the judge, you only have yourself to blame. Again, if you're going to get anything out of this video, it's preparation, self-improvement, not self-pity. Nothing's going to happen by accident. You know, you might, there might be some luck involved, but the more momentum you put into positive actions based on creating new beliefs, which is exactly what you've done is you've completely changed your belief system from moping around to this, somebody else has put me in this situation. This happened five years ago. You sucked it all up and you said, you know what, that's not going to change the situation I'm in, but what will change the situation, at least the, the here and now is I'm going to live my life to the best of my ability by making every day, making a better decision and looking at today saying, what could I have done better that I didn't do today? And tomorrow you keep working, you keep working. That way you're building yourself up for when you do hit adversity, you're prepared to deal with it. When, when did it change when it went from, I'm going to change these things because I think it might give me a shorter sentence to, wow, this is who I really am now. Where, where did you realize that this is no longer about getting a shorter sentence? It was no longer about getting RDAP. It's really about I'm a much better person than I ever was. I feel good about myself now. When I stopped, when I stopped physically crying, Dan, I haven't shed a tear since February 14th. Do I have moments of sadness? A little bit, but, they're, but, but these moments of sadness, they're, they're not sorrowful. That darkness was gone. Let me put it to you that way. Uh, that occurred probably around March. I just felt this optimism, and I realized that I control my own mind. It's up to me on, on how I view an, 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 an adverse event. What's good and bad is all up here. So uh, around March, I really, really, really started to feel well. After that day, I never really had any bad days, Dan. It's either been a good day or a better day. <laughs> and then uh, physically, I'll tell you when things started getting better. I lost my first 20 pounds. See, I was, I was a nice, happy, well-rounded 251 <laughs> in February. And I think by March, I'd gotten down to 230. And I put running shoes on. And I said, I wonder if I can run. I ran probably one-eighth of a mile before my calf started cramping up. And then within a month after that, Dan, I was doing three miles, something I could have never dreamed of doing in February. I have not felt this physically well since probably age 18. I was no longer going to be a victim of my own mind on February 14th. But again, none of these things would have happened without a positive mindset, without using, without speaking to you, using your techniques. And, uh, you know, not, not to beat a dead horse, but I would really advise everybody to watch your video from the halfway houses to really understand accountability and self-improvement. Because as I said, Dan, proof is in the pudding, brother. Sean, is there anything you want to leave our viewers and listeners with that you didn't get a chance to speak of that you really think they should know uh, as they dive into their journey of potentially entering the federal prison system? If your end goal is sentence reduction, as I'm presuming every, everybody's end goal is, then you have to address accountability. You cannot take accountability without being genuine, Dan. How do you sincerely feel uh, remorsefulness? That's only gonna come through self-improvement. And that's where you need a guide to help you. And Dan, I think that's where you really, really uh, do a good job in helping individuals. You help people see the fault in their ways, help them take responsibility, and more importantly, you help them put it on paper so then so they themselves can express to the courts. If well, I could give one piece of advice, it would be to be pragmatic and take the right steps. I can tell you when you force yourself to do something, even if you're not 100% sold on it, we've all heard the term, fake it till you make it. And it's okay to not, not have 100% faith that you're gonna ever feel the way you're wanting to feel. But if you start putting in the time, you start putting in the, the daily effort, you start making these positive mental and physical changes, Normally, what happens is, is over the course of time, you start to rebrand yourself, you start to make these new habits, which can take anywhere from, you know, 21 to 30 plus days, depending on the individual. Before you know it, yes, you still want to get into RDAP. Yes, you still want the sentence reduction. But all of a sudden, that becomes a secondary notation, you now really start to feel the benefits of reliving and coming alive again. So don't just automatically go, Oh, Sean, you're full of shit. Put yourself through the momentum, put yourself through the efforts for at least a month. And if you really take it serious, you might just feel a little bit different at the end. All right, guys, I want to thank you a lot, Sean, for coming on and doing this interview today. It, as much as it means to me, it means even more to the people that are listening to this that are in the same shoes that you're in. And many of them are in the, the prior steps that you're in. And they're trying to get to that spot that you're at right now. So it's amazing to see somebody willing to share their story 
practice this humility. And all I can say to you, Sean, is just keep on trucking, man, because this will be over before you know it. Thank you, Dan. All right, everybody. RDAP Dan, Federal Prison Time Consulting, People Up and People, Communities Method. If you're in a situation where you need help, you know what to do. The link's in the description. The number's on the screen. Act now or you might regret it later. Peace, guys.